talk about do what I, the name of this presentation is do what I mean, not what I say, how to run an agile project for a waterfall client. So first off, I want to thank you all for coming to the last session of Drupal GovCon. I'll try to not take too much of your time. Uh, my name is Noah Wolf. I've been a web project manager for over a decade. I worked as a government contractor for over six years. I've been in psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago. I worked in Capitol Hill, I worked for Think Tank. Uh, I've worked for a philanthropy, publicly traded corporation, and a handful of government contractors. I've had clients uh, across the government, um, including National, Na NIH, National Institutes of Health, the VA, National Archives, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm a certified project management professional, also known as a PMP. Uh, PMP is a well-recognized waterfall certification. I'm also a certified Scrum Master, which is a relatively easy to obtain Agile certification. Uh, and it also requires you to become uh, incredibly, it requires that you learn an incredibly practical, flexible, and applicable way to organize your projects. Recently, I've also become a Safe4 Agilist, which is a Agile waterfall hybrid that's growing in popularity. All right, so by show of hands, how many people here are government contractors? And how many govies do we have in the room? Okay, great. So let me talk about um, my bias a little bit in how I'm presenting this information. So just sort of a fair warning. Uh, generally, I'm presenting it from the perspective of a contractor, right? Um, but as much as possible, I'm going to try to talk from like a more neutral perspective. Uh, but my intention is that this is going to work for both the contractor and the govy. Um, also, as a certified Scrum Master, Scrum's kind of my default agile way of thinking. So things are going to be presented as Scrum, but uh, it's not Scrum specific. I really want you to learn what you can from these examples. All right, so presently I work for the TISTA Science and Technology Corporation, uh, and specifically on a contract for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, Quality Improvement and Evaluation System, KEYS, and KEYS' Technical Support Office. So our project was to take their website, uh, which as recently as two weeks ago was this HTML-based site, And last Thursday, it's now this user-centered, user-centered designed Drupal 8 site uh, that my team, many of whom are here today, put together. So the team and I manage um, and self-organize using Scrum. Uh, and though we've already gone live, our period of performance doesn't end until next September. And uh, we, so we went live with a month and a half left in the contract, right? Um, and we're gonna, now we're gonna be iterating on this project, trying to make it as accessible as possible, automate as much of the CICD as we possibly can uh, within the time that's allowed, right? Uh, so my team and I put a lot of hard work, effort, and love into this project. Um, but we also were a little lucky in that our client and Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services in general uh, is supportive of Agile. That said, there's still an incredible amount of waterfall requirements built in the systems development lifecycle process um, that are required. Um, and that's the paradox I want to talk about today. All right, so why does the government so often ask for Agile, right? But then they require you to work in a waffle process that's working counter to exactly the Agile way you want to work. So again, show of hands, how many people have worked on a contract where they requested both Agile and Waterfall? Sure, exactly, you're still working on the contract, right? So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about the different types of Agile Waterfall contracts client contractor relationships you're gonna get into. Um, but first, like, I'm all about understanding root causes, right? So if you wanna understand why your client is structuring your proposals this way, we need to like, understand what is happening here. Okay, so before we talk about expectations and strategies for your contract, we're gonna dive deep. And first, let me broadly uh, and imperfectly define waterfall and agile. All right, waterfall. Waterfall approaches project management from relatively linear, sequential design approach, right? Value is provided at the end of the project. Um, there's a heavy focus on unflipped documentation, planning, and then you're gonna follow that plan. Here's a traditional presentation of the waterfall process. Um, and this really originated in manufacturing and construction industries, right? Where you had highly structured physical environments. And so that meant that like, if you wanted any kind of design changes, it was gonna become prohibitively expensive, right? So, but the waterfall process is typically gonna produce plans, milestones, documentation, and gonna have expected outcomes. In contrast, 
Agile uh, product, product development is a process. It anticipates the need to change quickly uh, and it's designed to adjust on the fly. Right? So this is one of my favorite images, top being waterfall, bottom being agile. So let's talk about this contrast, right? So the solution is designed and improved upon in an iterative way. Um, at, each stage, at each stage of the development, you have an opportunity to iterate and adjust as you need, right? So Agile generally, um, unlike Waterfall, Agile came from like the software development uh, industry where the environment where you're doing the work wasn't as structured as uh, some of the manufacturing processes and also you had the ability to be flexible without incurring incredible costs, right? Something else about Agile is that now it's recognized as a best practice. Exactly what that means, we'll talk about it a little bit. So, um, Agile showed up on most of the government RFPs that I've seen, right? Feels like Agile is being used more, but is this just my experience or like what's going on here? So, at Deloitte, uh, analysis by Peter Vichniki, apologize if I got that wrong, and uh, Marash Kellar found that in 2011, fewer than 10% of major federal IT projects describe themselves as agile as an iterative. Jump to 2017, fully 80% of major federal IT projects are now describing themselves as agile or iterative. So the government is overwhelmingly asking, overwhelmingly asking for projects to be iterative or agile. Um, agile is here to stay. This is the new reality in the government. Okay, so you know what I mean when I say agile or waterfall. Uh, we've seen where government's heading with agile. Uh, and we know that historically they've been running waterfall, right? So let's get back to our problem. Okay, the government's seen the benefits of Agile, uh, and they seem to be adjusting the projects to make them more Agile friendly, then why are they still asking us to follow classic waterfall approaches uh, while at the same time um, asking that we use Agile, right? If Agile provides value, why are there still waterfall requirements? Tradition? Not exactly. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that the reason why your contract asks for both Agile and waterfall is the Washington Post. All right, so what are we talking about? Let's take a step back. Um, my first job out of college was working on Capitol Hill. Uh, I'm in DC because I wanted to work on the Hill. Uh, and when I first worked on the Senate, I was working for Senator Chuck Hagel of the great state of Nebraska. And the first day I was handed a document. And the document had the title, 10 Commandments of Working on Capitol Hill. Naturally, this document had 11 items. So I'm only going to talk about the first today. Commandment number one. Do not put anything in an email that you're not comfortable seeing on the front page of the Washington Post. That's very true. Why is this? The reason is that if you write something that is or could be construed as wasteful of taxpayer dollars, abusive of power, or in any way offensive to your boss's voting constituents, your boss could be out of a job. Right? And when your boss is out of a job, you're out of a job. Okay. We're going to go a little off the rails, but let's bring this back to our work, right? So, uh, let me hear you. When someone wastes hundreds of, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars, it'll show up on the front page of what? The Washington, the Washington Post. Or, as our president likes to call it, the Amazon, Washington Post. Okay, so these are just some of the headlines that you might see. So what, what happens when, when these things start occurring, right? Uh, rightfully so, taxpayers get angry. And they contact their congressmen and essentially threaten their jobs, right? In response, what does Congress do? They're gonna hold hearings and discussions. They're gonna call members of agencies to Congress uh, or even members of companies that somehow relate back to the government. So, and all these people have to come and testify now that their jobs are on the line. And what does Congress do in response? More regulations on the agency, requires that agencies perform better planning, detailed oversight, granular reporting, right? So this doesn't happen again. Uh, and they also ask that the agency follow best practices so that they can avoid these issues in the future, right? As well they should. The Congress is the ultimate stewards of taxpayer dollars, right? Um, they then tell those agency directors that they need to include oversight, reporting, best practices in the contracts. They're required to put those in there, right? Um, they should do that, and, and they do do that. It's their moral responsibility and also their jobs are on the line. All right, so 
Um, and even further, uh, the director of that agency might be required to report back to Congress on, hey, what did you do? What happened with that? Uh, and of course, if a similar a case of fraud or abuse or waste happens again, what are they going to do? They're going to contact that agency and say, what did you do? Do you have the receipts? So they need to show that they require comprehensive planning. They need to show that they have the documentation, et cetera, et cetera. This is everyone doing their jobs. So, uh, and then at the end of the day, we as contractors will get contracts that require comprehensive planning, oversight, and reporting, waterfall. Um, and then we also ask for best practices, agile. So, uh, the fact that there's both waterfall and agile in your contract is not a bug, it is a feature. <laughs> The challenge is that Agile 6 is like a Drupal 8 module that you're being asked to put on a Drupal 6 core install, right? So uh, again, there should be a request for planning oversight, and there should be a request for best practices. The challenge is, is that the best practices tell us the old way of planning, the waterfall, and some of the aspects of oversight are counterproductive, okay? So the only issue here is that the planning oversight approaches, approach uh, traditionally placed in government is lagging behind the more efficient ways that we're starting to shift into. All right. Ultimately, humans are flawed, right? We often forget when you're working on a contract and you have some requirements that just don't make any sense that uh, those contracts and the requirements are written by a human being, right? The rules that manage those contracts, written by a human being. The people who responded to the RFP and wrote the solution, right? Again, people. Um, and all the people trying to execute on those contracts are people. So often when those RFPs are written, it's because the government recognizes that there's a problem. Uh, and if you're a contractor, your job is to understand what the root cause is and find that solution, right? Uh, and then, as a matter of fact, the real solution might be in direct conflict with the requirements as written. People aren't perfect. Um, any human developed process isn't perfect. Government contracting is no exception, right? We're all just imperfect people. So step one in doing Agile for Waterfall client is empathy. They're not perfect, you're not perfect, but you must work together if you're gonna build something great. So, agreed? Good. So now we've established neither side is composed of infallible robots. Let's get some work done. So how do we reconcile Waterfall and Agile? Well, first let's go back to the Agile Manifesto. Uh, how many people here are familiar with this particular document? Okay, so I've got some bad news. The Agile Manifesto includes both Agile and Waterfall, right? If you look on the right-hand side, you have processes and tools, comprehensive documentation, contract negotiation, following a plan, right? This is Waterfall. Now, it's also part of the Agile Manifesto. The Manifesto just emphasizes the left over the right. Right? It's not saying you don't do this, it's saying, hey, this comes first. You'd rather have working software and incomplete documentation instead of complete documentation and no software, or not working software. All right, so, so far, we see that to work agile for a waterfall client, you need empathy. Uh, you need recognition that agile emphasizes agile practice, practices over waterfall practices, but doesn't suggest they should not exist, right? One more critical tool that you need uh, to do not just an Agile project, really any, any project, that's trust. When you build a trusting relationship, you can collaborate, you can push and pull, and get to the real solution. Without trust, we all retreat back to the contract, which was written by people. And people are? Right, uh, flawed. No one is perfect, with the one exception of <laughs> Correct, Beyonce. Okay, but you really must po develop a positive working relationship with your client. Uh, if you can't achieve this, you're likely going to have a terrible time fulfilling the requirements of the contract, right? Now, that's not to say you can't fulfill the requirements of the contract. Um, you can successfully get paid for a waterfall project, check all the boxes, right, and get paid um, without trust. Uh, and if you do so, you may not provide any actual value to the people actually using the technology you created, right? Um, you cannot, however, successfully complete an agile project 
and meet user needs without trust, right? So want to check boxes, waterfall away. You want to create real value, bloat your users, you're going to need agile, which means you're going to need trust. Okay, easier said than done. How do you build trust? Through consistent and predictable behavior, behavior and transparent behavior. All right, how do you do that? You demonstrate consistent behavior with practice and training, right? Uh, through repetition and showing value. So here's my favorite exercise for building trust. Um, and this also works with friends, family, and really, you know, just interacting with any people in general. Um, so when I'm on a contract, what I always do is I say what we're planning to do, planning to do uh, and then I'll schedule a time with my client saying when I'm gonna report back on the progress of what we're doing. Um, and then at the time I said I'd come back and report to them, I report to them, and I set a new time and just repeat, right? Now notice, no part of this was, uh, or specifically what, what I've talked about here is reporting on the status of the plan. It's not committing to a certain amount of work being done and then reporting that that work got done because you cannot actually predict the future and know what actually is gonna happen because there's gonna be all kinds of challenges that are gonna come up in your project as you're moving along. So, um, naturally you should also obviously do the work as best you can, uh, but it's unpredictable, right? Your reports, however, can be predictable. You can predictably show up every two weeks, every week, and talk to your client. All right, the other piece is transparency, right? And by that I mean honest, regular, uh, being honest regularly and as early as possible. Um, don't paper over every single flaw of your contract, right? You can fool some of the people. You can fool all the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. Your client is not an idiot, okay? If you only report good news, your client is not fooled. Uh, what you're telling them actually is that you will do anything to put a good face on this contract, right? Um, which means that they know if they complain about anything, you're going to go crazy to enact whatever unreasonable request they have, in scope or not. Uh, and this means that you and your team are going to be miserable. It also means you're going to be probably working out of scope. Um, but really what you want is to team up with, with your superhero client. You want to let your client know as often and early as possible when there might be an issue. And what steps you're taking to mitigate that issue, and again, go back to reporting, when you're gonna report back on the issue, right? Maybe you use your risk register, maybe you have some other process, but you wanna make sure regularly that you're showing you're being thoughtful and that you're also solving problems or working through the problems. Um, chances are when you're doing this, you're gonna fix those problems before they come, before they come up, right? If you, you're a month out and you say, hey, I think four weeks from now I might have an issue, and then two weeks later it's solved, uh, you're gonna be building that trust. Uh, when you're demonstrating that you're looking for possible issues and that you're gonna to work to solve them, your client will begin to trust your ability to manage unanticipated, unanticipated problems, right? So when that eventual big surprise does show up, and it will, uh, because waterfall, despite Waterfall's best effort, we're unable to plan for every contingency. Um, but if, when that happens, your agency will have already seen you and your ability to problem solve uh, the issue at hand no matter what comes up. So you've already built that trust and then when those things happen, you're able to keep going. All right, so uh, we're about to talk about those various examples of the different kinds of relationships you might run into. Um, but as for any good contract, I'm gonna state my assumptions up front. So my assumption here is that uh, we're talking about a website or software project for the federal government, right? Um, these examples also assume that this contract has already been won, right? So in the future, a good talk to give might be how to write your contract so that it's more friendly to Agile. My initial thoughts on that is you probably want to write to your process, not to your solution, right? Because we presuppose the solution before we go back to talk to any users. You probably don't know, you know if that's really going to work or not. But if you talk about how you work through the process, how you're going to talk to users, what you're probably going to do after you talk to those users, um, you're probably going to do better at actually presenting what you're going to do. Um, but I'm still generating data on this topic, so I'm not ready to talk about that today. All right, so let's get into the different the examples that I, uh, I pitched in this presentation. So the three types we're gonna talk about are client that's open to Agile, client that's hard waterfall, and the true Agile client. So client that's open to Agile historically has been waterfall. They're interested in ideas that work and they wanna get the job done. 
but some aspects of the process originate in the 1940s and they've been working on trees themselves and are growing and evolving, right? In my personal anecdotal experience, uh, this is what I've seen most often. Uh, if your client has asked for agile, they're very possibly they're this type, right? Next is the hard waterfall client. I've encountered this client as well. Uh, they're strong and they get jobs done, even if the result is not as tidy as you might like. Um, you most certainly would not want to make them angry. Uh, and I expect that this is the default in government unless they're looking to bring Agile to their project. And finally, the hands-on Agile client. Uh, this is more rare. Uh, I've not personally experienced this example, so I asked my friend Greg Gershman of Ad Hoc for some uh, examples and insight on this. Um, and this is a client uh, or part of an agency that kind of may be an island unto themselves within like the larger world of the federal government. Um, they've been innovating, creating technology that no one else has been able to. They're lean and agile by nature. But they're a little bit removed from everyone else. All right, so open agile. Let's start with the government agency, historically waterfall, interest in agile. First off, what are the kinds of patterns you could expect? Um, these are a little bit kind of good patterns and bad patterns, right? So uh, on this kind of project, you're gonna be managing expectations around project management. And you're gonna be doing a lot of teaching your client about Agile. Uh, they want to support your use of Agile. They're typically open to adjustments um, and they want to know, know more. Some of the challenges are that they might not have a great understanding of what that means, right? Um, they may have been holding meetings with Agile titles, they're having stand-ups, they're having sprints, <laughs> but your approach is going to require them to change the way that they think about these things, right? For example, that 40-minute stand-up is not going to be 40 minutes anymore. Um, expect uh, that the usual waterfall documents, project plans, milestones, and, other pro and any other products uh, might be coming up in this project as well. So uh, at a tactical level, these patterns are going to express themselves in a couple ways, right? Um, the client might not be planning to be intensely involved. If you're really running, again, going to my bias of like Scrum, if you're going to have like a real Scrum product owner, this client might not actually have made the time or they have other things they're doing, they're not gonna be able to participate in that way. Um, so, uh, the other thing is that, again, like, like I mentioned before, you're gonna have that extensive documentation requirements. Um, and if you wanna make changes to your plan, it's gonna take a lot of paperwork, right? So if you adjust the project as you go, you're gonna be filing lots of contract adjustments. So, some of the ways to address these is, uh, if your client is not prepared to be intensely involved, you as the PM, again, I'm assuming you're the PM, uh, you as the PM now become the product, the product owner. I keep hitting these mics. Um, so you're the product owner and you hire a scrum master. Uh, the product owner and scrum master are two positions with conflicting responsibilities. Even the project manager and scrum master have conflicting responsibilities. And attempting to do both at the same time is going to have bad results. So. Uh, you become the PO, you understand the client's needs, and then you're helping set the backlog. You're helping kind of figure out the iterations and providing the business analyst knowledge that, they really, that your scrum team, need, scrum team needs to do their job. Um, and then also you want to bring that client into the process as much as they can, right? You want to give them a training on Agile if they're open to it. Uh, you want to educate in the moment when it's, a, when it's possible. Um, contract requires extensive documentation. You just gotta do it. Uh, as a PM, this is your job, right? If you're the project manager uh, and you shouldn't be the scrum master, um, you have time to work on these things. The, the documentation, managing the budget, all the things that aren't covered in the scrum process. Um, again, Agile emphasizes working software over comprehensive documentation, right? Uh, so you wanna find ways where you can uh, you still have to do the documentation, but find ways with your client where they'll be comfortable with you using other uh, Agile artifacts as your documentation. For example, uh, sometimes JIRA tickets can count towards your overall reporting, or if you have meeting notes, put in confluence, that counts as a lot of the documentation that they're expecting and looking for. Um, it's a conversation, but it's definitely a path that a lot of people can take. Uh, so if you want to change your overall project, right, you want to make change to the contracts, as PMs, you gotta work the system, right? Um, it's not fast, but it's gonna create that paper trail that your client needs 
in order to sign off on the changes that you're trying to make, right? So submit the changes to the project plan as appropriate, uh, maintain communication with the client, and they may shift their, their mindset to working software over comprehensive documentation. Um, and when there's that trust working, you might be able to get that change in the contract that shifts it more to your process and less about a specific solution. So um, the way you're gonna bring this client into the Agile process is gonna be a lot of communication, a lot of talking, a lot of educating, and uh, providing them training throughout for it. So kind of concluding on the open to Agile client, your overall takeaway is that you're educating and adjusting expectations as you work together. Um, at the end of this project, the client should know more about Agile, they should have learned something, um, and will hopefully be looking for more Agile on their future projects. All right, so let's talk about hard waterfall. Um, this project might be structured antithetically to Agile, right? Uh, the process might be strictly defined as waterfall. Uh, for example, your client might require too many staff for a proper Agile team. Um, a contractor friend of mine once had a contract where he was required to hire 40 engineers and one scrum master. <laughs> this is a true story. It's, and it's just not possible to work the contract in that way. Um, the other thing is the client might have no interest in Agile at all, and they're not going to want to or have planned to participate in Agile events. Uh, they might be able to like, set the priority and see as their responsibility. Hey, it's all in the contract. Just do it all. I don't know, what do you mean the priority? Just do it. Um, and another, another challenge I learned when talking to my team about this and getting their feedback, uh, they said that in projects where they were in, in a waterfall project, they very often had like, gaps where they didn't have something to do on the project because of the way the project was structured and they're all hired on the beginning, maybe someone's just sitting around for a couple weeks until their part of the project comes up. Um, the good news is that Agile is probably listed in the contract, right? So this gives you that like crack in the door, that justification to start bringing these ideas in and trying to work that part of it. All right, so let's talk about the challenges, right? Project hard coded for waterfall, clients uninterested, uh, not all teams engaged at all times. So. If it's hard coded for waterfall, you might need to fight for modifications, right? If it's totally nonsensical, if it's 40 engineers and one scrum master, you could probably have a conversation, maybe get there, add another project manager that's really a scrum master or something, and you work it out. Um, but you're gonna have to work the system in order to get those modifications. Uh, if the client's not interested, um, what you may need to do, and this is not, does make me feel good to say this as an agilist, is create a bubble around your team and your process, right? So as a PM, you still gotta be that waterfall face, providing documentation, trying to hit those milestones, hitting those deadlines, but um, at the same time, you're creating a space for your team to be like collaborative and do what's gonna keep them engaged, right? Which leads to the last one. Now that your team is engaged at all times, if you work inside that small, agile-shaped bubble, uh, the team might allow your team to feel, that bubble might allow your team to feel some ownership and give them the ability to be creative with the overall unhelpful restrictions. So big takeaways with a hard waterfall client is ultimately you're working around the system to achieve results while still meeting the letter of the contract, right? It's not where you wanna be, but it's a way to approach it. Um, at the end of the project, you, what you're looking for is your client to be exposed to the concept of Agile. Um, and you should have hopefully been able to demonstrate like how a more Agile process creates efficiencies in the project. All right, finally, your true Agile client, right? So, uh, what pattern to expect? The good news is that they're committed to the approach. Like, they understand the responsibilities of a product owner. They know what it means to own a product. Um, they know what this product's about, typically. Um, they might even, like, already know who the users are. So you're not trying to figure out who we need to speak to here. You actually, they know who these people are and they connect you to them. They can connect you to them. Um, and if they don't know who they are, they're gonna help you find it and they're gonna uh, get you in touch with those people. Um, they're going to be an advocate for you for the product in the organization, right? Um, they're going to help with budget issues if those things come up. Uh, they're going to help balance priority um, with whatever else is going on in the larger agency because sometimes from on top of the front office, there's some changes that have gone to play. This team's going to help you work through those while still getting your contract complete. Um, and they're going to make themselves available to the team, right? Sometimes they actually are legit product owners and then you're gonna have them in your scrum meetings and all those other pieces of the project. Um, the other side of it is that because this is so new to the government in general, 
everyone is relatively new to it, right? So everyone's still learning. But these people are going to be much more practiced than anyone else. Um, and there's a really good chance that their broader agency is not agile. So what are some of these challenges, right? Uh, so they have a good understanding of the problem, right? They know what the product should do. Uh, I'm sorry, they may not know what the product is supposed to do, and that's fine. That's all part of the process. We're just trying to identify what are the, what are the challenges you're going to look at here. Um, again, there might be that agency-wide software life cycle, life cycle process you need to follow. And so you know, to get the system up and running, you're still going to have to jump through those hoops, waterfall, get review, those kinds of things. Um, and ultimately, the cop might not be able to protect you from everything going on within the organization, right? Uh, and the other piece is that uh, if you and the client are both working totally on the agile part of it, um, you might, when you're ready to launch, you might not have done the documentation and security reviews that you need. So what do you got to do? Uh, you got to work the software lifecycle process. Uh, as I mentioned, Greg Gershman helped me with this. Uh, so that piece of it, he said, there, there's a real risk that you'll have the work in place, um, but the documentation and security reviews aren't ready. So what you want to do is build that into the project. Right? You want to find the time to do that. Use the PM, working with your team. Um, so PM, sharpen your documentation pencils. So uh, and then if you're if you're if they're not able to um, going back to like knowing who to speak to, if you're if they don't already know how to connect you with, like I was saying, they'll connect you to the right people. So at the end of a, a project with a true agile client, um, you should know more about agile by the time it's all said and done, right? You should have uh, a more sophisticated implementation of your Agile process. Um, not because your client showed you how to do it, but because you worked hard and evolved and learned about it together as a team. So, conclusions. Um, bottom line is working as an Agile team is it, hard, and, but it can produce incredible results, right? Your contract has Agile and Waterfall on purpose. This is to make sure that taxpayer dollars aren't wasted, People don't lose their jobs, but it's still a challenge. Um, you gotta empathize with your colleagues on both sides of the contract, right? If you don't recognize that you're human beings, you're gonna be trying to work these requirements that were written by imperfect people and are likely paradoxical. Uh, you gotta build trust with your client or contractor. There's no trust, nothing's gonna get done. Um, and finally, in whatever way you can, create a space uh, to do great work under a variety of circumstances. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions about this or have any experiences that they want to talk about? Carla. Just the, you know, the, in those situations where the client really has no clue about actually, yeah. um, you end up having to serve in that role product owner, and then you also have to cover the role of scrum master. Um, and then you've got your project manager. So just that, you know, find a common cost of implicit there, that oftentimes they're not really um, empathetic to needing to cover. Uh, you know, run into that, where you have to cover those roles because they don't do, they don't want to be the product owner, and they don't want to participate actively. So then you have to do it on your side. Yeah. And then there's even additional costs of having you act as the product owner, but then you have to engage in further time and efforts to go back and check that. Yeah. You know, that, that any representation that you may be doing to the rest of the team as the product owner um, is on track with what they're thinking. Yeah, so uh, again, the question was uh, how do you fill in those roles? We need to be the product owner, and you need to hire a scrum master to make up for what the client's doing, how do you cover that within the budget that's been allotted, right? And the answer is it's a challenge, right? First, you wanna see if you're able to build this into your contract ahead of time, really understand what are the roles that you need in order to get the job done. It's always a challenge to price things correctly, right? Because we can't see the future, we're imperfect, all that. Um, but sometimes the question is how can you work within your team to like still meet those needs? There's not an easy answer, but you know, maybe there's a, Part of your cross-functional team, someone can work as a business analyst, and maybe your business analyst is now your scrum master, and your PM is pulling out. Ultimately, if you need to staff it correctly, if you don't have the right staffing, it's not going to be possible to be successful, or you're going to be running around like mad trying to meet the needs under you know, budgetary restrictions. 
can, can I add a suggestion to that? Please. So one thing that we've got is, is just not call them a product manager because it, it, in any relationship, the client has to there has to be a stakeholder who makes decisions. Yes. And you set up a RASI chart, you know, who's who's responsible, who's accountable, and the person who is who is the decision maker is your product manager, and and then from there you educate them as to what that role is because as a, as a as the vendor you can't be the product owner because ultimately they're the ones who have to approve it. Um, so so that's, a, that's a way to finesse it so that someone in your client is is going to be the you know, quote unquote product owner. Yeah, again for the recording, the, the suggestion was that ultimately in the government contract, there's going to be someone who makes the final decision. So by de facto, that is your product owner. Um, the challenge is, at least that I've experienced, is that I've had like a project manager where they're not willing to make any decisions. They always bring it back up to their boss. So even though they're, they should be the de facto product owner, their boss really is, but their boss has got more important things to do. So then I'm finding myself making sure I understand ultimately what they're trying to get at. What is my vision, what the boss is really looking for? And then I'll always coming back and checking in on those. But yeah, you're, you're having, I'm meeting with the PM, the PM's meeting with the boss, maybe I'm also meeting with the boss, instead of just one person making the decision. So it's definitely a lot less efficient, right? That's the waterfall part instead of a more agile process. Where engaged. Trust that person to know that, that they need to be communicating with the ultimate decision maker. So yeah, exactly. And, whoever, and even if someone lower down can make the decision, can do the decision making, they might not have the time to sit with you and like groom the backlog. Or they might not feel comfortable setting their priority even if they do the rubber stamp at the end, right? They might feel more comfortable going back to the contract and say, well, the contract says this, right? Which is why I try to get back to the trust and empathy. If you can build that trust, that person is gonna start to feel more comfortable. Like, okay, we can make these decisions. Ultimately, we're gonna go talk to my boss. Um, and that's what's going to help make sure that things really work. Uh, so it seems to me that the, the root catch-22 here, right, involves the requirements of documentation. Because for waterfall, you can't build software until you have documentation, right? The requirements filled out. Yeah. But in Agile, you can't have the requirements until the software is built, right? Yep. So I guess what, and when, particularly when you have what I think you would call a, a Agile curious, you know, client. Mm -hmm who wants to say he's doing Agile, you know, be, be Rockstar in his agency, yeah. that actually gives you a big list of, of, of document requirements in order to implement, that then may be a moving target and it changes to go. I mean, do, do you have thoughts on sort of how to square that circle and, and how to communicate in such a way that you can generate that trust initially? Because it seems like in the absence of that trust, yeah. you can't say to that client, yeah, we'll figure it out as we go. We got Jira tickets, you know, we're gonna have sprints, you're gonna have a little bit more every two weeks, we're gonna deploy it. Um, yep. what, what can be done to initially kind of set up that process so that there's not mistrust on both sides? Yeah, so uh, the question was, if you haven't yet established trust with your client, and they're expecting waterfall, they have requirements they want you to hit, how do you build trust and then ultimately shift to that agile relationship uh, during those first months if you're not hitting those requirements and milestones? So uh, part of the way that I approach that, um, and this was in one draft of this presentation in here as well, um, is at first, uh, you are kind of following the letter of the law a little bit, right? Um, but you're trying to think at yourself, okay, if this is my own project, how would I go about ultimately fixing this, this creating the solution, right? And you might have some like restrictions overall on the system, right? You're at an agency and they have a particular cloud hosting service they're gonna be using, and for whatever reason that was in the requirements, okay, great. You now have something you could definitely work on that you, you're gonna have to do no matter what, um, so go ahead and get started on that piece of the process, right? Talk to the client and say, hey, first thing we're going to do is work on this cloud stuff. And also we're going to you know, start doing some of that UX research that was you know, one or two lines in the contract. You start building that UX conversation um, while you're still delivering like tangible results. Yep, we talked to the contractor. We got the AWS instance set up. We're starting to build out some of our CI, CD tools. Um, and you're, you're building that trust. You're having those meetings. You're reporting on results. Meanwhile, you're starting to build this ammo with your user research. And then you come back to them and say, hey, you know, we've been on the project for two months now. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of users, and I know originally you asked for X, but looks like X doesn't help them at all. They really need Y, right? What do you guys think? You start having that conversation, um, and hopefully now you've also kind of talked about how you work as a process and 
you're talking about user stories, you're talking about you know, end users, what are their needs, um, and hopefully you're able to then kind of make that, that bridge, right? So that, that's how I think about it. Do the things that you definitely have to do that you know you're gonna do anyway. Um, use that to build the trust in order to get permission to uh, do Agile. Yeah. Up top. Can you talk about what tools that you've used or seen used to help facilitate this? Uh, what in particular? Well, you mentioned, I mean, so are people using Jira? Are people using GitHub? Or, like, what, what are tools are people using to enable? It'd be a lot of Agile based around that, right? Yeah. Uh, adopting Jira, let's say. Sure. So I've, in the past, gotten really excited about a particular tool, one or the other. And what I've come to find is that, like all human-produced software, it, they're all ultimately flawed, right? And they're all built for a particular use case, which may not be yours. So what you really got to do is find, I mean, what I'm openly saying is like, there's no one software that's going to be the right software or tool. Whether you're using Jira or Post-its, it's what is your process? Are you actually bringing out real information? Are you really understanding client needs? Are you uh, providing value back to your, your customer and your ultimate end user, right? So Jira's fine, GitHub's so fine, Bitbucket. So like, are there tools that, that, that people are using? More, more not, I don't need you to name, I didn't mean like, to ask you okay. the best. Um, like, what, what have you found useful? So sometimes, again, going back to like the requirements of the contract, Government might say, oh, you have to use JIRA and Confluence, right? Or you have to use GFE, you gotta use government furnished equipment. Um, on my most recent contract, we were required to use government furnished equipment, which is provided by a different contractor. And that contractor, in my opinion, hasn't been doing a great job at serving that up. They've been doing a lot of changes trying to make things better, but at first it was not good. And we were waiting months for laptops or access. And literally what we did was create an entire parallel process using our company furnished equipment, right? We had our own company AWS instance, had our own laptops, just did what we had to do while we're waiting for all the rest of it to catch up. And then ultimately at the end, we went and just switched over and like figured out how to bring the process back into the government. But it, like we work what we can now, because if we just waited for everything to go exactly the way the government was handing it out, the, the, we would not be delivered by now, right? We'd still be trying to get things done. So. Ultimately, your question's about you know, what, tools are, what tools make it work. Um, for me, the tool is Scrum, right? It's the process of saying, hey, what are you focused on? Are you focused on the end user? Do you know what the end user needs? And then bringing that back up to what the client was asking for, right? And creating that relationship, creating that trust so that I can show them, hey, look, this is really what you're trying to achieve here. You might not have ever thought about it, right? So there's no... Uh, there's no one tool that I think is you know, the best tool. Um, it's really about consistency of a process that works for you and your team. Cut, one suggestion for a tool that I found is kind of a gateway drug for getting people sort of interested in Agile is a Kanban board, yeah. which you can add, like in Jira, you can add that to a traditional project. And it's just gives them the idea of these you know, kind of swim lanes, and then, and then you can kind of add the idea of this. Sprint. Yeah, right. even in the Agile, you have the same board. Your board is just releases versus right. Uh, versus it's dated. Just to get, get somebody something familiar, but at the same time, kind of get them interested in, in, in that. Yeah, the tools are like doing the least amount of work as po as as possibly can, which is like do only the things that matter, right? And like have definition of done in your tickets, and like it's it's all those pieces adding up to being focused on what the real work is. And there's no like simple answer like, well, if you use Jira, it's going to go good for you. It might. It might go terrible, right? It's all about how you're using it, how you're working the process. Are you providing value to the end user? Are you providing value to your engineers? Are you providing value to the customer? If everyone isn't feeling value out of what you're doing, people are going to like drop out. They're going to lose faith in the process. They're going to lose faith in you, and it's just not going to be as successful. So I'm Captain America as a situation, and then okay. we are starting to get into that. Mm -hmm. But I dealt with a team of developers who really are pushing the agile in the sense of I don't have to document anything. Yeah. yeah. That is not okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're wrong. So we the other half. That's cheating. Other than what other than flat out saying, I don't trust your judgments and I don't think you guys are doing the right thing. Yeah. How can I specifically like if I'm saying I you know, I have a spike, I have a user story, I want to see what kind of modules are gonna fit this user story. Yeah. 
see your analysis. I want to see a document that comes back to me that says we chose this one, here is the problem, here's our solution, and here's why we chose it. I'm getting the fight back of that's not agile and I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, so the, the question is from a government employee who's saying they're having agile engineers who are saying, I don't need to do documentation, that's not part of agile. Well, first off, in the fundamental document, it is part of agile, right? You want the thing to work more than you want it written out, but also like write it out, right? And not, like as part of like finding different ways to have comprehensive documentation, um, one of the things you, like as a contractor, what I would ask for is like, hey, instead of writing everything out, can we do it inline, commented out in the code, right? Does that work? And if I sound, you seem like someone who might say like, yeah, that's fine, but as long as you, you know describe overall how to use the thing, that works, right? But it has to be that conversation, and. Engineers who are not even doing that, they're not helping themselves, they're not helping the other engineers. Like, that's just basic, like, doing the work properly. Yeah, <laughs> right, no, like, when the bug comes up. The stories have to be catered to getting that outcome, too. Like, the documentation has to be its own outcome. Right, that's the angel methodology. What you're describing is the actual development. Yeah, there should be yeah. inline commenting, but you're talking about a spike. You write it as a ticket. Uh, that's your acceptance criteria. Given as I'm the sponsor of this project and signing your paycheck, <laughs> you need to show me the result of give me a document that tells me a recommendation for an approach or out of these three choices why we should do A versus B or C. Yeah, and that's it. it. So yeah. it's a defining success, right? So yeah. you're saying this is what success looks like and like the, the it has to fit that. No. Granted, they'll push back and say, well, do you want to work on this? That's because that's five points. Or do you want to really work on that on this, which is right. five points? Which, which is fair. Example. You have yeah. to make that call and prioritize or say, yeah, both of these need to come in, but this other thing has to go out. So going back to your, again, the question of like, you're asking for documentation and engineers saying no, let's go back to the empathy, right? Why are they saying no? It might be they don't feel like there's any value in doing that. They feel it's a waste of their time, right? Typically, when I get pushback from engineers, it's because I might be asking for something that I don't realize they see as a waste of their time, right? So we got to come back and have the conversation to show the value. Why is it valuable to comment out your documentation in line? Because you're going to deal with this bug in a year from now, and you want to know what's going on in this location. You don't want to, it's terrible to go to some like document printed out in a three ring binder that doesn't help you. What does help you is find that git commit, you look at that code, and right there it says, oh, we put this in because the date was not showing up because of Y2K or whatever. And now, oh, okay, now we see what's going on. Actually, there's a module for this now. We can fix it, right? But if they don't feel value out of that JIRA ticket or the documentation or any scrum ceremony, they're going to check out because they don't feel like it's a useful, you know, useful, useful way to spend their time. What's worse is that you may even see this not just on documentation, but uh, on many tests that you had, that's often Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Building on the, this conversation of showing value, uh, the audience is talking about how test-driven development is sometimes not seen as valuable to the engineer or to the client, right? But again, that's coming back to that overall education. You also want to educate your client that, hey, we're all people, right? Like when there's a bug in code and you've gone live and the contract's done and they call you up and they're like, why is there a bug in the code? Why didn't you do it right the first time? Well, ultimately, we're people and you know things change or you know, the systems we're working on or the databases that these are all relying on have changed and it's unforeseeable, right? But can we work together and get to a positive result? So those conversations are, give you a chance to talk about, well, let's talk about test-driven development, right? Here's what's gonna give you, this is what it's gonna give to you for the long, term, long haul as a government agent. And to the developer, hey, look, we're giving you a definition of done before you get started. So now you understand what you're building for. If it passes this test, you're done. If it doesn't, you're not. This is just our agreed upon way of saying when this, this is done. But you need to get that buy-in. If there's no buy-in, people are going to feel like you're wasting their time and then they don't want to be around. It protects us as well, right? Because then if something does go wrong, that there wasn't a buy-in test score, you know, you can't say, why why isn't this broken? I was just 
just dealing with the client who knows very familiar with who's kind of an issue that is uh, something like two and a half years old. And it's broken for two and a half years, but it was just discovered, right? <laughs> the client's digging out some like, why did this fail test really do? There was never a test written for it, right? It's been broken for two and a half years. But I think that's why that empathy and trust is needed to be like, oh, right, this process protects both of us ultimately. We all want to have written the test for something that broke. Yeah. But actually writing it, you know, in the beginning is, is going to require that, that mutual trust. Yeah, and, and ultimately that also goes back to the overall government desire for like comprehensive planning, documentation, right? Congress doesn't want to spend money on things that aren't providing value. Um, but they also want those best practices. Test-driven development is going to provide value, just not the second after the engineer wrote the, wrote the test, right? It's a best practice, and ultimately it's going to save you money, but it takes time to develop that relationship with the client, with the agency, with Congress, with people in general, um, so that we can ultimately make that actually part of how we structure these contracts. All right, well, it's 10-2. If anyone has any other questions, I'll take them now, but otherwise, let y'all out of here. Thanks, guys.